Around the year of 2011, engineers at Heroku noticed that the best practices for building software applications actually repeat themselves over and over again. So they came up with an idea of writing a manuscript or basically framework called the 12 Factor App. And it incorporates all the best practices that every software engineer, in my opinion, has to know. And I would even call this the Bible of software development or application development. Now, without further ado, we're going to go over all of these 12 factors really quickly. So we're going to go over the first one. And I have to point out that this was developed many years ago, but most of the points are still intact, meaning they're still basically the baseline of software development. But funny enough, the very first point called code base, which says one code base tracked in revision control, many deploys is probably the most outdated ones because this first one was basically defined when we didn't have Git or GitLab, GitHub so much widespread as we have it now. So basically this one says that you need to have a code base to keep your code, okay? Now, of course, we have evolved since then. Now we have monorepos. Now you can have submodules with NPM, meaning you have you can have dynamic repositories under this big repository. So repo, it's a main, and you can have one repo un living under it, and you can scaffold them at the same time if you clone the master or main repo, so to say. We can have monorepos that would basically incorporate all of these libraries within one big repository so you can have multiple ways of structuring your code and i would say this one is the most most outdated the second one is called dependencies meaning explicitly declare and isolate dependencies this is very crucial because at least in the world of node.js we have a manifest and in other frameworks and programming languages as well because whenever you install dependencies you want to make sure that these dependencies are the same ones if your friend installs them on their machine. How do you achieve that? Because they can be updates to these dependencies. Well, at least in Node.js, you have a thing called package log.json. It basically defines every dependency of dependency and locks them to specific versions so that if you do npm install on a different machine, you get the same versions of the libraries recursively, just to make sure that you get the same basically environment every time you start the app. And of course it cascades or projects to applications running without, within Docker as well. If you're using any other programming language, for example, C Sharp, Java, how does it look like you? Let me know down in the comments. What is your alternative of the package log.json? I'm curious. The next point would be configurations. This is also very crucial because there can be a lot of security breaches if you don't manage this properly. So usually configurations would be um, hard coded in the code. This is like a very rookie mistake. You can you should never put the configuration or API keys or secrets within the source code itself and push it to Git. It's really hard to get rid of it and attackers can basically search on GitHub and find your API keys and then basically use your account. What do you need to do? Well, there is one way. You can, of course, create an environment variable, put it to git ignore, and make sure that it doesn't end up on git, but still you have to manually transfer it to your colleagues, maybe via USB stick, maybe via cloud. But nowadays there are even better alternatives. For example, uh, there are third party companies that can manage the secrets. So you basically were, you're gonna call their API, authenticate yourself, and then gonna retrieve all the secrets can be done also during the CI pipelines or AWS also has its own secret manager. And basically this is another way of making sure yet that your config, config files are secure. Another point is backend services. This one is interesting. So it says treat backend services as attached resources. What does this mean? So let's say you have a node server, okay, or service rather, and it is connected to a database. Okay, we're gonna say that this is a data, uh, SQL database. Okay, this is a database and we have a connection here. Now, if you treat it as an isolated or attached an isolated resource, it means that you can keep the logic in your service because your service shouldn't be care about the internal workings of the SQL database. And what we can do is if in case if there's an error or 
this SQL database is malfunctioning, we can literally spawn a new SQL database and simply repoint this connection. Oops, this is redundant. I'm going to take this one and instead of pointing it to this one, I'm going to point it to the new one and I'm going to delete this one and we're done. Okay, we're simply going to point to a new database and we have to make sure that everything works intact. So this is what the fourth uh, factor is telling us about. Next one is called build, release and run. What does this mean? It simply means that you should strictly separate all these stages. So in your pipelines, in your CI pipelines, you need to have a build, you need to have a release pipeline or a release stage, and you need to start the application actually or the service. Now, nowadays, build and release can actually be done in the same stage, but running should be um, auxiliary or uh, detached from the build and release. Why are we even talking about this? Why not do everything on the, on the same stage? Well, imagine the, um, the running of the application didn't run for some reason, maybe there was an outage. Well, we can take this image because building and releasing will create an artifact. What do we mean by artifact? Well, in the world of software development, artifact is basically some a produced file. For example, if we build our node app and then make a release of the, this node app, what we are usually gonna get in and nowadays is a Docker image. Okay, if we are using containerized images, we're gonna get a Docker image with a specific version of this app, our app within it. If you don't use Docker, we're simply gonna get an executable, or we can get a, um, a, a folder, okay, it's still an artifact. And then let's say if we didn't manage to run it for because our cloud provider just failed to run it, we can take this artifact and re reuse it. We can run it. Okay, this this run didn't work. Forget about it. Okay, this didn't work. We can simply take it and run it again, literally one minute later. Okay, this is important. Another one, processes execute the app as one or more stateless processes. And this is directly connected to the point of to, to the topic of horizontal scaling. I even have a video on horizontal scaling, so go check it out. It's gonna be in the description below. What is basically saying that if you have nodes, multiple nodes, and if you have too much pressure, you need to make sure that you can horizontal scale, meaning uh, execute the app in one or uh, many stateless processes. And the keyword here is stateless, because when you try to horizontal scale, you need to make sure that these scaled instances basically are going to be copies of the same app. They don't have uh, any st state machine inside because you don't want to replicate the, the, the state or the database. Let's say this is a, con not a Docker container. You always want to make sure, because this is a best, best practice, that you have one place where the state lives, which is going to be a database, okay? And if you scale your services to three or 10 instances, they're all going to take the data from this one database. Can also be two if you scale your database. It's another topic, but basically separate the processes and make sure that they're stateless. Go check out this video. I think I'm going, good. I'm going a bit deeper on this video. Next point is gonna be port binding. This one is very simple. Apparently back then, port binding Okay, it was not new, but it wasn't so obvious that your service doesn't have to care about the requirements, whoever is using the service. Let's say we are a web server and the web server wants a port 80, okay, from the app that lives within. Now, what this uh, factor is saying that you don't have to expose port 80 from your app. You can expose any, any port, let's say 4200, but whenever we're hitting your container, you can set up a port forwarding here, basically on this layer, that's going to bind port 80, which the client needs to port 400, and then reroute the request that way, meaning your service actually don't have to care doesn't have to take care of the port binding, it has to be done in a different resource. Okay, next point is called concurrency. And this is pretty much the same as the six one there are slight differences, but since this has been done many years ago, 
there were some deviations, but you can treat it as the same thing. Next one is disposability, which, which says maximize robustness with fast startup and graceful shutdown. What does it mean for us? So whenever we're starting the app, and obviously we're gonna have some dependencies, we're gonna depend on this service, we're gonna be dependent on this service. After your main app has started, make some health checks. Basically call one of the health checks API um, endpoints of this microservice and call uh, this microservice to make sure that your dependencies are up and running again as well. For example, in Kubernetes, you can easily set this up to make sure that you have some dependencies. And also don't forget about graceful shutdown. I'm gonna make a video about proper graceful shutdown in the world of Node.js. So if you're a JavaScript developer, definitely subscribe because this is gonna be interesting. But when you shut down your services, you also need to make sure that, for example, that there are no dangling connections to the database or any socket connections, or that uh, you shut down a transaction. So let's say you're making a database transaction and your server suddenly stops to make sure that there's not nothing um, pending, that you close the socket um, during the graceful shutdown if somebody turns off that server, okay? So that your socket doesn't live while the server is gone. Next one is gonna be development and production parity. So keep development, staging, and production as similar as possible. Nowadays, this is easily covered with Docker containers, okay? We're, diff we're basically gonna produce and a Docker image, and we're going to pull it, use it in a dev environment. We're gonna pull it to staging environment. We're gonna pull the same image on the production and simply run this container, and then you are keeping this parity. Another one is gonna be logs. Very under underestimated. Logs are very important in a production environment, especially in the enterprise. All right, so you want to make sure that your logs are processed correctly. What's your, your, what are, what you're usually gonna find that um, your um, service is outputting uh, logs to the standard output. So let's say we have this service that, that's responsible for one part of the application and uh, basically three different parts of the application and they produce different logs, okay? They produce different logs, but how can we as a developer go and debug stuff if we need to? Are we also actually gonna go to three different services and try to look at the logs? This is not maintainable. What we're gonna do is to make sure, for example, that we use open telemetry, which is basically an observability framework, basically kind of a standard, let's call it that way, that you can integrate with other third-party uh, platforms, such as Elastic, bind it to Sentry, LogRocket, and so on, which is going to aggregate your logs here and put it to some platform, let's say Elastic, okay? And then you can easily search, or CloudWatch from Amazon, you can easily search for the logs and filter them by date, by name, and so on. And you can uh, debug your applications much easily. And the last one, admin, oops, actually opened it, admin processes. Running admin management task as one of processes not really relevant anymore. We're not logging into our um, service and not starting the apps. Everything's done more or less automatically as long as software is installed, such as Docker Engine, Kubernetes, and so on. All right, guys, I think, I hope this was useful. If you think this was an interesting video, thumbs up, and I'll see you guys in the next one.